Today, uh, we're going to talk about where did God go. Uh, really, one of the one of the very interesting things that um, I discovered as I was studying the word for myself. This is, is actually a great reason why you should read the Bible for yourself. We don't read it through every year. Um, we have, uh, on, if you go on the church's website, really easy to find, Tularosa Community Church. Just type that into Google. It'll be, I think it's no spaces, tularosacommunitychurch.com. So, I mean, if you can go to Google or you can just type it in, you're going to find it. So we, we made sure that it, it redirects to the page and everything. Really easy to find. We also have a Facebook app and everything. But if you go on our church's website, on the top, it'll have, um, uh, I think it's called a Bible reading plan or something like that. If you click on that, uh, it will walk you through a daily um, uh, reading through the Bible, uh, January, February, and everything. So check that out. You know, just, uh, that, that's for reading through an order of the events that happened. But you can just read it through otherwise, anyways. But um, and this is one of the one of the neat things that you get because it's not really in one of the books of the Bible. It's actually kind of a theme throughout the Bible. And so our little journey today starts in Genesis chapter three, verse eight. Now I, I warn you already. Uh, we're going to be going to a lot of different scriptures. So if you don't want to turn to each different one, that's okay. Oh, I totally understand. Uh, but the first one is Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. And it says this, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So Genesis opens up with the creation of the world. And it really doesn't spend too much time on, on how, he, how he did it or anything like that. It just pretty much says he did it, and it goes right on to the story. Uh, and, and so Adam and Eve are the first man and first woman created in, in, this, in this new world. And uh, God made them a special garden called the Garden of Eden. And so they're, they're living in, in, this, in, this, um, in this garden. But then they, they, they sin. God, tell, God tells them not to do something, and they do it anyways. And so as a result, they realize that they're naked. And they're like, oh man. So it says that they make themselves things to cover themselves, and then they hide themselves. And uh, then they hear God walking among them. He's like, hey, where'd you guys go? Now, obviously, he knows where they, where they went. But, you know, it, it's that kind of an idea that, that God was with them, right? There was absolutely nothing separating them from God, right? God's presence was there. They were there. This is sounding pretty good, right? But then they mess up, and, 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 and we see this, this break happen. Uh, in Genesis chapter 3, because of the sin, it, um, God lays out curses that are now a part of the creation. Now we have death, we have decay, we have, you know, um, with men taking, taking um, what's it called? Um, uh, domination over women. You know, women not ever being able to break from that. And we have a history of, of actual, um, you know, women being uh, kind of trampled on by men because of this. This is something that affects the entire world. Everything that happens after it is, is completely affected by this. And so God actually kicks them out of the Garden of Eden and uh, places angels to guard it so that nobody can ever go back. So you read through Genesis, and it's just kind of the, this theme. You know, it's, it's, some people are seeking after God, but a lot of people are just doing their own thing. Um, but then finally, at the end of the book of Genesis, we have, what's the theme of Genesis? Why was Genesis written? And Joseph says this, you all meant something bad, but God turned it towards good. And that's kind of the theme of Genesis, that people keep doing stupid things, and God keeps turning it to good. You know? And so then we're, we, we finish with Exodus, and the, it isn't resolved. The issue's still there. And we get to Exodus, in chapter 13, I'm going to look at, um, the, the offspring of Adam and Eve eventually become, um, well, through one of the lines, I should say, because they, you know, um, I'm skipping all the stuff about Noah and everything. That's good stuff, but not really relevant to what we're talking about tonight. So eventually, uh, there's a man born called uh, Israel, and he has these uh, 12 kids, and this becomes the 12 tribes of Israel. Long story short, I'm summarizing a lot of stuff here. Read the Bible, and you'll get it for yourself. Um, but uh, just all this stuff is happening, and, and, and his descendants, those 12 tribes of Israel, end up in captivity to the nation of Egypt. Which is where Exodus picks up at. They're in Egypt. They're they're, they're working as, as as slaves, and uh, but then it doesn't take long, and God hears them complaining and, and crying out to him, and he saves them from Egypt. So then in Exodus 13, that's where the story picks up here, and and let's see where is God in this. 
Because remember, he's been separated. He no longer dwells with people, right? So then in Exodus 13, uh, verse 21, it says this. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. So now we have a little bit of step up. Whereas before, you know, God was out there somewhere. He wasn't dwelling with people. But now in Exodus, we have a little bit of a step up. He's not with Israel, but in front of them. So he's near them. Okay, this is, this is looking better. You know, things are, things are on the uphill. So then we get to Exodus chapter 19, and they get to, um, God leads them out from Egypt, and they, they come to a mountain called Mount Sinai. This is where God gave Moses the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay? So here in Genesis chapter, I mean Exodus chapter 19, verse 18, Moses has gone up the mountain to meet with God. And it says this in 18. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain uh, trembled greatly. A kiln is basically like a stove. Um, so now we have Israel at this mountain way out in the wilderness. And now we have God. Okay, God has led them there. He's been with them. Now he's up on the mountain, so they know where to go to find him, right? But then all of Israel says, no, we don't really want to do this. You go talk to God, and we'll just kind of chill out down here. This is kind of too scary for us anyways. And so Moses goes up there, and he does the communication with God. But he's, he's talking, and, and God says in this way, face to face. Now, that doesn't literally mean that God, that he saw God in his full glory because no, no one can see God and live. What that means is that he met with him personally. Okay, it, It's kind of like, a, what do you call it, an idiom, I think is what it's called? Uh, a phrase? Uh, you guys know what I'm talking about. It, it's, a, it's a, what? Intimate. Yeah, in, in an intimate way, yes. Um, so then we get uh, towards the end of Exodus. Now remember, God's still up on the mountain, right? He's not dwelling with his people. In Exodus chapter 40, they've gone through all this stuff. God gave them, you know, parts of the law. He talked to them about the tabernacle. All this stuff is happening. But then at the end of the book, we have the actual significant thing. Because remember, the tabernacle, this, this tent of meeting, this, 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 this place for God to meet with, people, with his people is nothing if God's not actually there, is it? So we get to Exodus chapter 40. And uh, the very end of the book, and in verse 34 through 35, it says this. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled in it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The glory of God was so there that Moses, who was, by the way, the one that God chose, the one that God gave the law to, couldn't even go in. Okay, so now we have a big step up. God's not over there on the mountain. He's not over there leading us. Now he is in the tabernacle. Okay, this is, this is good. So this means something, but what does this mean? He's in the tabernacle. It's basically, a, a, it's basically a, a, a temple that you take down and set back up. It's like a giant tent. Um, so then we have a little bit, of, a, a few questions. What's the significance of this? And if you go to that first, uh, first slide there, buddy. Uh, the purpose of the tabernacle was so God could dwell among Israel and be their God. See, God has wanted a fellowship with his people. But because of sin that we committed against him, now that separates us from God. But God, throughout the Bible, is in this desperate quest to renew things to how they should have been. And this is the good news. So we have this. If you look at this map, I know it's a little bit hard to read the words. Don't worry about the words. That just says um, where the tribes were. Don't worry about that. The idea that I want you to get is if you look, you see the tents all around the tabernacle? The tabernacle is a thing in the middle. What that meant is God specifically told them, put your tribes around the tabernacle. I am in your midst. I am in the middle of you. I am not something that you have. I am everything that revolves around your life. Your nation revolves around me. Your people revolves around me. Everything is about me. I am at the center of your life. Okay? God was not a God. He was the God. He was a saving God. He was a powerful God. So, we have this still. The tabernacle was separated from the camp with a curtain that only had one entrance. If you look at this picture here, you can see that there's that curtain that goes around the tabernacle, okay? You see it? It's kind of like, like a border. What that means is even though God dwelt among his people, they were still sinful people. And so because God is holy and perfect, he can't, there's still that separation there. So he's among them, he's with them, but he's not so much in them. 
Does that kind of make sense? And I know that seems like a hard distinction to make because we're done with prepositions. <laughs> and I mean, I don't know about you, but I had one heck of a time with English when I was in high school. So, you know, trying to find the right preposition that, that fits what we're talking about here is a little bit difficult. But he's with them, absolutely. He's among their midst, but there is still a separation there. And that's what the courtyard symbolizes. That's what that outer curtain symbolizes. There, that there is still a separation. And then God says this, Offer me these sacrifices and do it in this way. And then he says, I will purify it. I will heal you. See what I mean? He never says, these sacrifices that you do, they're going to heal you. He says, no, no, do this. But I'm going to do the healing. I'm going to do the touching. I'm going to do the do the work. Okay, I mean that's a very big distinction. So now we have where did God go? Okay, He's with Israel. Okay, this is good. And the tabernacle was in the middle of the camp. This is good. Because of this, they had to offer many sacrifices to maintain the tabernacle as holy. See, a large part of what the animal sacrifices did in the Old Testament was it set the tabernacle as a holy place apart from God, for God, apart for God. That was a large part of what the what the what the sacrifices were for. Okay? But if you notice, there's this one entrance. Now, this is obviously an image of what would come through Christ. How many ways are there towards salvation? One. The first thing as you walk into the, into the courtyard is the place where you, where you offer the sacrifices. This is, this is an image of what would later become Jesus. Jesus is the only way to salvation, and the only way to reach through God is through the perfect sacrifice, who is Jesus. Now, um, that's not my point, though. That's just to make sure we're all on the same page. The entrance of the tabernacle, okay, this thing, th this one opening into that courtyard, was on the east side. This is very important, okay? You go to the next side there, buddy. Because in a lot of the Bible, not every time, but a lot of the Bible, going from east to west means going from sin to God's ways, okay? Let me show you. It starts in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. And it says this. This is after they've sinned in the Garden of Eden. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, Adam and Eve had three main sons that we're going to look at. They probably had more sons. That, in fact, I believe it says that they had more sons. We're not going to talk about them, though. Um, Cain, Abel, and Seth. Now, Cain killed Abel, and Seth eventually fathered Noah, who eventually fathered Israel. And so that would be God's holy line, right? So whatever happened to Cain, it says that he went east. It doesn't say that about Seth, though. God, it says Cain went east. East is away from God's presence, away from the Garden of Eden. So now we get to, all the way down to Exodus, and we have the tabernacle where it says, now make sure that you put the entrance on the east side. Why? Because you have to turn from the ways of the world, the pleasures of sin, and you have to go west. The same way you exit, the same the same way in reverse that you exited out of the garden, you have to enter that same way into the tabernacle. Okay, going east to west. There's an image there. Okay, so that takes us to First Kings. Israel didn't spend the rest of their life at the mountain, although I'm sure some of them thought they were going to spend the rest of their lives on that mountain. They eventually settled in the in, in Canaan, which later became Israel. Modern day, it's Israel, Jordan. Uh, part of, I think, Syria, Lebanon. No, kind of Lebanon. It depends which map you're looking at, I guess. <laughs> uh, but anyways, and they set up this king, this kingdom, um, which at first, um, it's just supposed to be a people serving God, God as their king, but eventually they reject God as their king, and they say, no, no, we want a person as a king instead of you. And so God raises up King Saul, and that happens and everything. And you can read this in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. I'm really just skipping all that because it really doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about today. But throughout the course of time, um, Israel gets this really good king. His name is King David. And he actually becomes a symbol for Christ. Because the same as King David was considered the good, righteous king who had a heart after God, Jesus is our perfect and good king. And how much more could you have a heart after God if you are yourself God? <laughs> right? <laughs> so then we get to, uh, he has a son and his name is Solomon. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, Solomon built um, God a temple to replace the tabernacle. Now, this is the tabernacle, okay? This is, this is that tent, that large tent that's out in the dunes, right? But David ends up looking out and he says, you know, this isn't right. I have this palace and you have this shack out there. And so he says in his heart to build God a temple. 
But long story short, his son Solomon has to do the actual building. If you want the specifics, Second Samuel. <laughs> I'm really trying to condense this here, guys. And Solomon builds this temple, and so that w- that's where we pick up in 1 Kings chapter 8. So God was in the tabernacle, right? That's what this whole thing is about. Where is God? Okay. At this point, he's still in the tabernacle. So then we get to 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10 through 11. This is what it says. And when the priests came out of the holy place, they, they finished building, and they, they finished putting everything in there like they were supposed to. And it says this in verse 8. And the, um, sorry, in verse, uh, I lost my place, 10. Sorry, in verse 10. Um, and when the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Okay, where's the glory of the Lord now? Where is God? He left the tabernacle, he went to the temple, right? Right? Okay, so, so now we know where he is. He's in Jerusalem in the temple. Okay, things are looking good. And all the Israelites have to go to Jerusalem to, to do their sacrifices that one time a year at the Passover and stuff. I believe there were three sacrifices total that they had to join together in Jerusalem. Don't hold me to that, but I believe there were three. Um, and so, okay, we're on the mend where things are looking up. And the temple took the tabernacle's place. What happened to the tabernacle? Some people think that Solomon just set it up in the temple, or some people think that they destroyed it. The truth is the Bible doesn't really say, so we don't know. Um, so then that takes us to Ezekiel. Now, what happened after that? Israel lived happily ever after, right? <laughs> what happened was eventually Israel got involved in sin. And so as a result, the kingdom got torn into. There was a northern kingdom, which was called Israel, and there was a southern kingdom, which was called Judah. All right? Now, King David's descendants always stayed on the throne in Judah, but King Solomon had many different kings many different lines. And in fact, that's one of the things that, that said in the prophets. They say, you have keep putting up kings without asking me who should be the king. And I believe that's in them. Ah, I want to say it's somewhere in Hosea, but don't hold me to that. It's in the prophets, I know that. Like, uh, it, it makes me laugh in the New Testament. There's this part where Paul or Peter writes and they say, as it's written somewhere, you know, it says this. <laughs> so I'm going I'm to I'm borrow from, from Paul and Peter. As it's written somewhere in there. <laughs> Um, So Ezekiel chapter 40, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, no, 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 Ezekiel chapter 10. So eventually, because of their sin, God eventually causes um, a kingdom, an empire really, called Assyria to destroy Israel, the northern kingdom, okay? But then some, Judah continues to exist for some hundred years, Okay? But then, God tells the prophet Jeremiah, look, go and tell them because there's this new empire, Babylon. They're going to come and they're going to destroy Judah. And so that leaves us with, so what about God's glory? Where is God going to go if Jerusalem is destroyed? Because we, he's in the temple in Jerusalem, right? So what's going to happen now? Well, Ezekiel prophesies in chapter 10, and he says this in verse 18 through 19. Um, then the glory of the Lord went out from the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth before my eyes as they went out with the wheels beside them. And they stood at the entrance of the east gate. What, what gate was that? The east gate. So you're saying the glory of the Lord left Jerusalem from the west to the east, right? The same as Adam and Eve left Garden of Eden from the west to the east, right? The opposite of God's glory coming, west to east. God's glory is leaving. Well, this doesn't look good, does it? Uh, of the house of the Lord, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them. So Ezekiel prophesies throughout really the early, the, the early, you know, the early parts of the book, and he basically says this: that God's glory is slowly departing from the house, from the from the temple. And here's the thing: nobody in Judah knew that God's glory was departing. They had no idea it happened. They were living so severely in sin that they were completely oblivious to the fact that God was no longer in Jerusalem. What did they say? Oh, this has left the, left the building. God has left the building. And they were oblivious because they were living in sin. So where does, where does, where does God go? Where, where, where does he go? Well, let's flip over to um, chapter 11 and verse 23. Okay. Now, catch on to this because this is actually a very important part to the coming of Jesus. Okay. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of, of the city. Now, later, there was a place put on this same mountain, which was called the Garden of Gethsemane. 
Does anybody remember this from the, from the Gospels? Okay, now remember that, okay? We'll come back to that. Um, so God's glory left the temple from east to west, I'm sorry, from west to east, and the years leading up to the destruction of Judah at the end of the Babylonian Empire. So by the time that the Babylonian Empire got there and destroyed Jerusalem, God's glory wasn't there anymore. So then we, we, we get, how, why, weren't they, why weren't they destroyed for touching the most holy objects? Because God wasn't there anymore. They were just objects. But, but Israel, Judah didn't understand that they were just objects anymore because they weren't seeking God. So where's God? He's out on the, over, over, over the Mount of Olives, where the Garden of Gethsemane will be. Okay, He's out over there. Now what? Well, all the people of Israel get exiled. They get taken away from their home. Bad news, right? But then Babylon gets taken over by this new empire. Yes, there's a third empire. This gets really complicated, right? This empire is called Persia, okay? And their king is called Cyrus. Now Cyrus comes in and, and takes over Babylon. You can read about it in uh, Daniel. Um, after uh, the current king, uh, well, long story short, last king was God. And so Babylon falls that very night, and Persia takes over. And uh, then that takes us to, so what now? Well, Cyrus takes the throne, excuse me, and he allows Israel to go back to the promised land. Well, okay, this is, this is sounding good. Let's flip to Ezra and see what happens here. I can never remember that, that Ezra is before Esther. That, that bothers me every time. I want to say this after Esther, and then, no, here it is before. Um, Ezra, chapter uh, 6, verse 16. So, okay, they go back to the promised land, they build the temple, and the glory fills it, right? Well, let's look. 6, 16. Um, and then, and I'll start at 15. And the house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. And the people of Israel, the priests, and the Levites, and the rest of the, the rest of the return to exile celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. They offer the dedication. Nope. Nowhere in there does it say the glory of God filled the temple. Uh-oh. So where, where's God? Where did God go? Well, he's still over on the Mount of Olives. Why didn't he fill this temple? See? Well, wh what happened? What was it? Was it what? Well, what's going on here, God? You were, what? So eventually what happens is this temple gets um, kind of like a facelift, if you want to say that. I mean, it's kind of like a complete rebuild, but it's fine, by a guy named King Herod, which is the same, I believe, the same King Herod that you read about in the Gospels. If not, it was his father, but I think it was the same one. Um, but nowhere in there does the glory of God fill the, fill the temple. In fact, years later, Israel is taken over by yet another world power. Oh, are you tired of that already? Um, Rome. And one of their general, General Pompey, enters into the most holy place of the temple, but he doesn't die. Why? Because God's glory is not there anymore. It's doubtful whether the Ark of the Covenant was even there. Most people think that the Ark of the Covenant was either lost, stolen, or destroyed when Babylon destroyed Jerusalem. So now we're left with, what happened with the Ark of the Covenant? Don't know. But whatever happened with the Ark of the Covenant, the temple, God wasn't there. So we're left with this big question. After 70 years, Babylon is defeated by Persia. They go back, but the glory didn't enter the temple. Now, what is going on, God? Well, so now we flip a few books down to the New Testament in chapter, I mean, sorry, in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 10. And remember, God's glory is still MIA. Nobody knows where this, where this is. God, if they don't know where God is. He's just out there somewhere, right? Okay, so Mark chapter 10. Uh, I'm sorry, it's 11. Mark chapter 11. I don't know why I said 10. Jesus has started his ministry on earth. He's doing his thing, but the last stop before he gets crucified is Jerusalem. Okay? So we get to Mark chapter 11, verse 1. It says this. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. There's God. Right where he left in Ezekiel, there he is waiting. Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village and find me the, um, in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, 
I will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street. And they untied it. And some of, some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying that colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy, uh, leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, bless is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, Hosanna basically means God save us. Basically, it's a whole long thing. I don't want to get into it. Uh, blessed is the kingdom uh, is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went where? Where did he go when he entered Jerusalem? He went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Why did he even go in if he wasn't going to do anything? To fulfill what was written. Because Israel was wondering, where did God go? Go to the next slide there, buddy. So here we have a picture, just a second. Here we have a picture of Jerusalem, and it's it's tilted. Okay, so it's not that's not north. North is like that. Okay? So over here on this north of the picture of the northeastern side is the Mount of Olives. Okay? But if it was tilted like it's supposed to be, it's over on the east side. So then goes God Jesus goes in. From there, from where the glory of God departed from, Je from Jerusalem so many years ago and was waiting on the Mount of Olives, he goes from that place. Which way did he go? West. From east to west, bringing God's... Glory. But no more would it dwell in a temple. No more would it dwell in a temple. God would dwell in our hearts. He goes in through the eastern gate and goes straight to the temple. And that is where we find Jesus crucified, and the veil is torn down the middle. Because God was done with the temple. It served its purpose, it's out of there. It's gone. So then, okay, we have Jesus dying, now what? So then we get to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Starting in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. See, Jesus dies, he's resurrected, it's great and everything, but now they're just kind of sitting in Jerusalem, like, well, what do we do now? And then, God's glory fills the new temple. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And, of, um, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Where is God now? Where did God go? In them. They were his new temple. We are his new temple. Where did God go? He's with us. Not in a building. Not in a place. In our hearts. And the Holy Spirit is always there to lead us, to guide us, to fill us, and to use us for the kingdom. But it doesn't, it doesn't stop there. There's good news yet. <laughs> Hold on. We, now we get to 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20. It says this. I'm in 2 Corinthians. It helps if you go to the right Corinthians, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price to glorify God in your body. Okay, this is this is looking up. He's not on a mountain. He's not in a tabernacle. He's not in a temple. He's with us. He's in us. Awesome. That's the end of the story, right? Nope. Because we only experience a small fragment of the coming glory. A small fragment of it. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting all excited here. Okay, now we have to go to Revelations. Revelations chapter 21. Well, I was going to read something from Colossians, and I'm going to go ahead while you guys turn there. Colossians chapter 127 says this. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. 
Now in, Reve in Revelation chapter 21, we see that we don't see the whole picture, huh? We just have a small fragment of what's to come. So let's look to see what the big picture is. There, Revelation chapter 21, starting in verse 22. Now, John has this fantastic vision and, or dream or whatever you want to call it where he sees all the things that are going to happen in the future. He sees, you know, the coming of the Antichrist. He sees, you know, the, the judgment of the wicked. He sees all these things. But then there's this thing at the end where he sees the new heavens and the new earth. Where God, sin is no more to think of. The past is it's long forgotten. It's, 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 it's way back there somewhere. You could say it's, it's, it's in the east. <laughs> and also, uh, before I go on, when the Bible says that God throws our sin as far as the east is from the west, what that means is he's completely throwing it away from his presence, away from his glory, away from his remembrance. You are completely forgiven. Because the west is where God's glory dwells, and the east is where it does not. Going towards the east. Right? So, remember that. Revelation chapter 21, um, starting in verse 22, then on through 27. And it says this, And I saw no temple in the city, and its temple is, um, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. And its light will, and, and, and by its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. See, Revelation describes something that we can only hope for at this present time. See, because although God dwells in us, there's still that barrier there. Can you reach out and, where, where's God? Well, he's in our hearts, yeah, but surely that's not the finished picture, right? Because that would mean that after we get the resurrected bodies, we aren't even in the same place as the Garden of, of Eden. We're still in a lesser place. No matter what happens on this earth, we're still not arrived at that place where they were at the Garden of Eden. But now we have something better than the Garden of Eden, where we have a glorified body, and there is no temple, and God dwells among us again. See, God dwelling in us is good, but that's only a fraction of what is to come in the new heavens and the new earth. Pretty exciting stuff, right? Amen. Amen. So there's just a few things in closing. First off, Christ's death made a way for God's presence to be with us. Christ's death was so that we could know God. We could walk with God. Right? God didn't want to be out there on a mountain somewhere. God wanted to be with his people. Amen. Our sin is covered by Christ's sacrifice, and God dwells in us rather than a temple. Absolutely. God is with us as we pray, as we seek him, and as we do his work. See, Jesus is our mediator to the Father. That means every single time that we pray, we have absolute confidence that Jesus Christ is interceding for us and that our prayers are heard. Every single time we pray. That means every time we seek God, it doesn't matter if it's the worst worship leader in the world or the best worship leader in the world, Jesus made a way to the throne room of God. That's a powerful thing. That is a very powerful thing. But that's not it. That means that every single time that we do the work of the ministry, we know that God is with us. When there has to be a situation where there's a discipline necessary, Jesus says this, I will be there in your midst where two or three are gathered. I'm going to be there with you as you have to deal with these difficult situations. When we do ministry, when we go out and witness, witness to the world, God is with us there too. Because the temple isn't somewhere off in the distance. It's in us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we can lead forth in victory, even when we don't feel very victorious. Even when we don't feel very victorious. So this is also a warning to us, also though, not to let sin reign in our lives. Absolutely. Why, why if we're free from our lives, do we still have to not live as immoral? Because God didn't free us from right and wrong. <laughs> See what I mean? There is still right and wrong. We are God's people, and we have, to, uh, we have to make God the center of our tent, the center of our heart. Does that make sense? So Jesus' death didn't make sin okay. It made God reachable. It made God reachable. Very exciting stuff. Very exciting stuff. We, uh, we know that if God doesn't come for another 100 million billion years, we know that there is still an intercessor for us to carry us through that time. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going we're gonna to go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to pray for three things. Actually, probably two, because I 
It slipped my mind what the third thing was. We probably won't pray for the third thing if I can't remember what it was. Uh, the first thing is we're going to pray for salvation. If, if, if you would like to, uh, if you would like to be saved, it's very, very simple. You trust that God will save you. You stop sinning, and you ask for Him to forgive you. It's that simple. Stop sinning. Trust that He will hear you when you ask Him to forgive you, and then ask Him to forgive you. It's that simple. There's no, there's no, you know, symbols you have to write out. There's no ritual you have to carry through. It's that simple. You can do it anywhere. You don't have to be anointed by a priest to do it. Jesus is the priest, so you're cleared. You just have to seek God and trust Him. It's that simple. And then the second thing that we're going to pray for, and I wrote this one down, um, is that we would show God's glory in our community. Right? Okay. So you don't have to just pray for those two things. Um, you can pray for whatever God lays on your heart. But I really don't remember what the third thing was, so we're not going to pray for that third thing. <laughs> So if you'll join me, Lord, I pray that there, if there's anyone here tonight, I'm sorry, this morning, that uh, has never accepted you, has never allowed you to change their life, Lord, I pray that you would soften their heart, Lord, that they would come to you with their whole heart. Lord, I pray that you would forgive them and heal them. And as they seek you, you would give them the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would help them to turn from their sins. Lord, to seek you with a whole heart and to trust that when you said our sins are forgiven, you meant it. And they are forgiven. And they are gone, even as far as the east is from the west. They are completely thrown out. And Lord, I pray for those of us who are your church, who are your temple. Lord, I pray that we would be a light. Lord, I pray that we would show God's glory. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be able to work through us, would be able to work in us, that we would harden our hearts, that it would be a soft, soft texture in God's hands. That like pre-cooked clay, you could mold us, Lord. Lord, that you continue to do your work in us. That you would help us to show that God is here, that God is near. Lord, and in our trials and our tribulations and all the things that happen in our lives that make us think that you're gone somewhere off in the distance, help us to remember, where is God? He's here. And you're with us always, God. You're with us always. And Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, tonight, Chuck will be teaching. And so I'll see you at 6. There's a potluck after the service at like probably around like 7.30 sometime. So.